Hi there, this is Daniel, and this is episode four, the Hannings and the early 70s. Before we leap into the early 70s, I would like to go back some time to highlight some important events. One month and two weeks before I was born, Sputnik was launched by the now extinct USSR, and our world was thrust into the space race. As were we all thrust into a new age of mankind. Our generation shares that common lineage, and the space race was a series of events that bonded my father and me. From the Mercury Redstone Project through the Gemini Projects, my father and I watched and talked about the advent of manned space flight. The culmination of that national pride and father-son bonding experience was the Apollo Project. President Kennedy had given this country an aspiration, a goal to reach together as a nation. It was 1970, and America was poised to meet that goal. When my father wasn't around, <clears throat> I would build models of a spacecraft. I remember a gas station that we fre frequented that gave away paper models, the old uh, slot A into tab B, of the command module, the lunar lander, and even a small version of the Saturn V launch vehicle. I just had to collect them all, and I did just that and hung them from the ceiling of my bedroom. I built plastic models of the command module and the Saturn V 1B. I tried to build one of the lunar module, the lunar excursion module, but it was a real de departure from a design point of view than anything I had ever built, and it just never looked quite right. I think a lot of guys made those models. I know I saw them in a lot of friends' rooms. But I felt that my father and I shared a special bond and with and to the space program. At that point, my father had shared the basics of electronics with me and the basics of 20th century communications. I had learned about capacitance and resistance, how to read electronic schematics from the symbols, from what the symbols mean to how to trace a circuit shown on a schematic in the actual chassis of a device. As well, I learned how to use and read a Vohm meter, a voltage ohm meter, and how to use it to find a break in a circuit. I also learned Morse code. Yes, the dots and dashes that make up the nonverbal communication of telephony prior to Alexander Graham Bell's creation, the telephone. As I mentioned earlier, I assisted my father in running phone patches, connecting concerned parents with their children in Vietnam. The space race was like a teaching example of everything he had taught me and we had done in the garage to that point. Every single day, electronics and long wave communications were in the news, and Americans were being introduced to the discoveries America had made reaching for the goal President Kennedy gave the nation. For my father and me, these were the best times of our lives. The whole world was using terms and gaining knowledge that we already knew. In social settings, we both were socially, we both had socially relevant knowledge. We understood why it took so long for a signal to come back from the Apollo spacecraft and got to explain the line of sight when it came to satellite communications. Why the astronauts were taking a laser into space, which had a good many people concerned they were pointing it at Earth. When I would work in the garage with my father during this part of the space race, it was all we talked about. We would talk for hours and we would share what we had individually read and my father would always explain the electronics or technical aspects of the flight. We tried to be together for every launch and every landing. This love affair with technology and the space race came to a head July 20th, 1969. That was the day the eagle landed on the surface of our moon. I remember sitting in front of the television beside my father. He had his single lens, single lens reflex camera pointed at the television. My father wanted to record this moment for posterity, for future Hannings to look at and remember the very important time for Ken Hanning. When Neil Armstrong set foot on the surface of the moon my father and I cheered so loud, 
At that moment, we both felt a national pride. Right then, that moment, America was the superpower on the planet Earth. And what was the greatest part? Nobody had to die to make our nation great that day. No one political party accomplished this goal alone. All of America stood together, side by side, and believed in this project. America believed in President Kennedy's dream, believed in the greatness America could obtain if we just worked together towards a common goal. Oh, well, I don't think I would have traded in, I don't, no, don't think I've traded in my bifocals for rose-colored glasses. Our country was in a bitterly contested war in Vietnam, and all of us had a family member in that war. Our nation was deep in a cultural war as well, and racial divisions were tearing our nation apart. But when Neil Armstrong stood on the surface of the moon, at least for that one moment, our nation was one. Not in grieving as we had been six years before with the assassination of John F. Kennedy, or just one year before in June with the assassination of his brother Robert. This time our nation stood together in the glow of national achievement. I think it was a defining moment for two generations, our fathers and mothers and ours. I have no doubt that everyone that is watching this right now, which I knew or knew me in school, remember where they were that moment. When John F. Kennedy was shot, when Neil Armstrong stepped on the surface of the moon, it was one of the few times when not in church, I saw my father with tears in his eyes. For most, it wasn't that we had beaten the Russians to the moon. I mean, some of us, <laughs> we knew that Russia would never set foot on the lunar surface. It's been 60 years, and no Russian still has set foot on the moon. America is the only nation to put a man on the surface of the moon. My father and I often talked that day. We carried it with us for all his days here on Earth. One of the last times I spoke to him, I mentioned that day, and I swear he, he got some color back and sat up so he could talk to me about that shared event. The space race continued, and Dad and I watched and followed. From this point on, though, we felt we were part of a dying breed. Social and public interest waned, and it seemed that Congress was completely wrong-headed about NASA and the manned space program. Kind of like today. I mean, not to get off the subject or anything, but many Americans were up in arms about mankind killing the planet even then. Now, if that's true, if it's true we're killing the planet and it's going to die, how would some of us get off the planet to continue mankind. Just a thought. So America is losing interest in the space program. We landed on the moon and for some everything is kind of anticlimactic after that accomplishment. But my father and I kept watching and tracking the program. April 1970, my father and I had a little company had a little company watching the space program. Apollo 13 launched without incident. As a matter of fact, it was the first Apollo launch that was not carried real-time by all three of the major networks. But on April 14, 1970, the eyes of our nation and the world turned skyward again. My father and I had become kind of neighborhood experts on the program, and we were answering a lot of questions from neighbors. It was nice that America was paying attention again. It was a horrible the reason why. Just three days later, on April 17, 1970, the astronauts from Apollo 13 safely returned home. Even though they were a little worse for wear and tear, they had made historic accomplishments in that process. Apollo 13 had the distinguished honor of being the single craft that, was, that came the closest to the surface of the moon without landing. In order to make its way back to Earth, 
the command module Odyssey and the lunar module Aquarius flew extremely close to the surface of the moon in order to take full advantage of a slingshot effect using the moon's gravitational pull. We and our neighbors watched in horror as the spacecraft came around the dark side of the moon and shot like a bullet towards home. The melees towards spaceflight had been broken and replaced by ginned up fear and hyperbole. It was this fear and hyperbole that killed our long flight manned space programs. And it is the major reason mankind 60 years later has not yet again set foot on the moon or any other planet. A dream died for my father and me and though I didn't know at a time, a distance began to form between us. I know we've come to the end of this episode and just entered 1970. Not what I had planned, but nothing of what I'm doing here is planned out. The recordings, the writing, the whole campaign has come out of deep feelings of desperation and separation. And yes, fear. I'm winging it here, folks. It is all coming from the heart. And for me at least, that keeps it genuine. Next, I'm hoping to have episode number five. That'll be Friday. This time, I'm not going to box myself in by giving it a heading in advance. We, all of us, are just going to go for the ride. Hope to see you here Friday. Thank you for your kind support. And may God bless.